Well, imagine it's your last year of life. I know, I know, hang in there with me. But at the first of every month of that year, you'd ask yourself this question. How am I gonna structure this coming month? What's my month going to look like? What would be on my to-do list? Who would I choose to spend my time with? What would I choose not to worry about anymore? You know, when life is done, we ask that question, right? What will people remember about us? But today, even more, we might want to ask that question, where will we spend eternity as well? We've been talking a lot about uh, what this life looks like, the brevity of life, also the chaos of life that we deal with. But one thing that we have to remember and understand is that Jesus is with us. Jesus actually predicted that he was going to die and then he was going to come back to life. He paid the penalty for our sins, but he also, this is so important, he defeated death and he gave us hope for eternity. So here's the thing about our own lives that we understand and know. You can live the healthiest of lifestyles. You can watch what you eat, exercise religiously, do all those things, pay attention to your well-being, grow in your relationships, and all these things are good. But the fact is, we're all still in the same boat. We're all still terminal. We're all still going to be facing death. And this is what Solomon wanted all of us to know in order for us to be able to live correctly. And he says this in Ecclesiastes 9. He says, the same destiny ultimately awaits everyone, whether you're righteous or wicked, whether you're good or bad, whether you're ceremonial clean or unclean, whether you're religious or irreligious, good people receive the same treatment as sinners, and people who make promises to God are treated like people who don't. I mean, he says this, it seems so wrong that everyone under the sun suffers the same fate. Already twisted by evil, people choose their own mad course, for they have no hope. There's nothing ahead but death anyway. Now, how about that? for a statement. This guy sounds like he's fun to hang around with. But what he's saying, he's talking about the reality of death, that we're all going to face it no matter what. He's not only saying, though, that death is evil, that it's bad. He's also saying that there's this um, evil way that death does its own work. It's like there's this injustice to it, right? He says the wise and the unwise are both going to die. The good and the bad, the young and the old. Nobody's exempt, he's saying. And the reason for that is that when God created the universe, there was no death. Death came after God created the universe. Death followed after mankind's sin. So when Adam and Eve sinned, they died. Uh, they died immediately in their spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit kind of moved out. This, there was a separation of the spirit from God. So this is what we call being spiritually depraved. They didn't have God living within them. They died progressively in their soul, which like is their mind and emotions and will. They were reduced to operating by just their soul alone, and which led to confusion um, You know, mentally. There was a lack of common sense. We complain about this all the time, don't we? This is where this comes from, sin in our lives. Fears developed and it takes over. Selfish choices rather than the choices of what's best for everybody. Doing what's right in our own eyes is how the scripture uh, explains it sometimes. But eventually they died in their bodies as well. They, they both died of old age. So Paul writes about this to some Christians thousands of years after this event. He says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone. For everyone sinned. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. You know, thousands of years before this was written, Solomon still believes we're in God's hands and that God has a plan. And he said it this way in Ecclesiastes 9.4, Still, even with all that death, anyone selected out for life has hope. And that's what I would tell you today. Solomon knew it. Paul knew it when he wrote uh, Romans uh, and Corinthians. Today, you have real hope. Peter writes about this. He goes, it's by his great mercy that we've been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And now we live with great expectation 
and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that's kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. You know, so how do we face life with all of its challenges? How do we face life with all of its joys? Well, I wanna talk about that in the next few minutes, and there's a few ways we can do this. And as we learned last week, just kind of reiterate this, we need to enjoy each day as a gift. Whether it's a good day or a bad day, we have to understand that every day is a gift. Solomon says, so go ahead, eat your food with joy and drink your wine with a happy heart, for God approves of this. What is, what is he saying? He's saying, enjoy your food, savor your meals, savor the moments that you have with people, enjoy each day, recognize them as gifts from God. God is the God of life. He loves, loves, loves life. He wants you to embrace it. But also remember that the gifts that God gives to us, the people and the good things in our lives, those are not God himself. So it's important that we keep God first and the gifts that he offers us just as what they are, gifts. So what does this look like? Well, let's talk about a few things. How about talking about sex? What he's saying is enjoy sex, but let's not worship it. Don't make it your end all be all. Don't pervert it by turning it into your own thing. Stay within the boundaries of God, within the boundaries of marriage and, and have have sex in those boundaries and understand and know that God blesses that in your life. How about uh, your family? Love and enjoy your family, Solomon would say. They're a gift, but don't worship your family. Worship God alone. And if the weekend is all that you're living for, if that becomes your God, you're really shortchanging your life. And you're playing with dependency at times as well, too, if you're not careful. So realize that not just the weekends, but every day is a gift. And people without a relationship with God do all the things of life. They end up worshiping God's gifts, though, as God's. Followers of Jesus, though, we look at everything in our lives as a gift from a loving God. And so our identity is in Him and not in these things. They're not based on whether we have good or bad circumstances, good or bad days. That's why we can live with gratitude in all things. That's why we're commanded and told to, in all things, give thanks. We're not thanking God for all things, but we're having an attitude of gratitude in everything in our life. So we, what, the question I want to ask you is, what are some gifts of, that God has given you that you need to thank God for today? Well, here's another thing. We, we worship together in a multi-generational church here at Fellowship. There's those that are children. We have teenagers. We have, uh, you know, Gen Z. We've got Gen, uh, we've got Gen X. We've got millennials. We've got boomers. We've got them all, right? Young and old. And so here's, here's a way to live your life. Accept every decade of your life as a gift, right? Recently, this past week, uh, Kevin Costner turned 68, and on an Instagram post, he wrote this. He goes, don't believe what they say about getting older. Each passing year is a gift, and it gets better and better with time. I mean, who talks like that, right, these days? Everybody, we like to complain instead, but Kevin Costner says, look, I'm enjoying every decade of my life. And you would say, yeah, if I had what he had, I would too. But again, let's not fall into that trap. You know, I'm a mission, I'm officially middle-aged myself, and I feel it every day in my life. I mean, these days, I can dream of running a marathon, and I'll wake up with a torn ACL, I feel like. Or a friend of mine recently had a stiff neck, and he was telling me about it. Later that day, my neck started hurting too, and I didn't do anything. How does that work? You know, our bodies age, but our inner self, our sense of self, it stays young. We think of ourselves as young. And then we get these rude awakenings at times, you know, sometimes in the morning I'll look in the mirror uh, these days and I'm taken aback of what I see and not in a good way. And I'm just like, yikes, who is that? And I shut the lights back off in the bathroom. You know, they say 40's the new 30 and 50's the new 40. But all I know is the older I get and with my energy levels, the, uh, the more I understand that 9 p.m. is the new midnight, right? Age steals some things from us, sure it does. Sometimes it takes our lifelong friends. Sometimes it takes our long-held hopes and dreams. We understand what life is. I mean, I remember turning 40 and getting a chronic disease that I've been having to deal with for the last 15 years of my life. 
and learning to live with that and learning to live with that limitation. And just recently, I'd gone out to lunch with a couple of other pastors and we just began talking about what God's doing in our life. And it turned out that all three of us had chronic health problems, things that we would never ask for, but they happened to us. And that can be so frustrating. But as we talked about it, we understood that it's also a daily reminder of our limits. And it was a reminder uh, that we had to trust in God, that we had to find our strength in God, that we had to remember him each day of our life. And it turned out to be a gift. Much like Jacob when he wrestled uh, with the angel, you know, back in the ancient days where he walked with a limp the rest of his life. It was a reminder that God was God and he was not. So even these chronic diseases sometimes can be a blessing uh, as long as we focus on God in our life. So Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, he goes, that's why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles, no matter what we're going through, they're small and won't last very long. And he had some big troubles, let me tell you. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them that will last forever. He's giving us some perspective here. So we don't look at the troubles that we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things that we see now will soon be gone, the brevity of life, meaninglessness, but the things that we cannot see, those will last forever. I mean, what amazing wisdom and perspective. Solomon writes about this aging process in Ecclesiastes 12. He says, remember him. He's talking about God. Remember God before your legs, the guards of your house start to tremble. And before your shoulders, the strong men start to stoop. Remember him before your teeth, your few remaining servants stop grinding. And before your eyes, the women looking through the windows see dimly. I mean, He's talking about the aging process here, that we change, that we get older. I mean, let me ask you this question. Do you agonize as you age? Is your value connected to your physical strength or your beauty or even your intelligence? You know, in his book, Abilities, Their Structure, Growth, and Action, British psychologist Raymond Cattell spoke of two kinds of intelligence that he's discovered in humans. The first is when you're young. He called it fluid intelligence. And it's the ability to reason, to think flexibly, to solve novel problems. In other words, today we would call that just raw smarts, raw intelligence. Innovators, movers and shakers uh, use this. Uh, This kind of intelligence though, here's the thing about it, literally it peaks and around your mid-30s, that's it. Like you're smarter, 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 smarter until your mid-30s. But then as you age, Fluid intelligence, he would say, he says, declines, but there's a different kind of intelligence, and he calls it crystallized intelligence. Now, crystallized intelligence is the ability to use a lifetime of knowledge and to be able to apply it to certain situations. In other words, rather than raw smarts, think wisdom. Success, guys, is found in your ability to embrace a reality like this, and to be able to adapt between the two because we're always changing. Things are always changing. And man, we struggle to accept things as they are, don't we? We long for permanence in a world of change. But God is always doing a work. He's always developing you. He's always growing you. And so every decade can be a gift. You know, Jesus says, don't get so caught up in this world that you forget about me. And that's so easy to happen. In John 21, he's talking to Peter and he says, I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself, went wherever you wanted to go. You had all these freedoms. But when you're old, you're gonna stretch out your hands and others are going to dress you and they're gonna take you where you don't want to go. And isn't that true about the aging process? Jesus said this uh, to Peter to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. In other words, he says, Peter, you're going you're gonna to die one day, and you're going to die because you're going to be fo- following me. Uh, you're you're going to be doing what I say. It's not going to be any other fault than that. And then Jesus told him these simple words, follow me. Follow me. Good days and bad days. Follow me. When you're young, when you're middle-aged, and when you're old, follow me every day of your life. Every day is a gift from our youth 
all the way to our last weeks on earth. Enjoy every single one of them. And remember that God and his pre presence, it's there in your life. So follow him. Put your faith, and that'll be my third point, put your faith in an eternal God who loves you. This is so, so, so important. You do not need to track through life alone. Solomon writes about this in Ecclesiastes 9. He says, live happily with the woman you love through all the meaningless days of life that God has given you under the sun. The wife God gives you is a reward for all your earthly toil. <laughs> Try that on for a marriage proposal, right? I love you. There's no one I would rather spend this meaningless life with than you. I mean, what a, what a way with words, right? <laughs> And, and he's also saying, look, it's not all about marriage. You know, it's not to say that singleness is diminished. Jesus was single. Paul counseled Christians to be single. He said it gives you such flexibility and the ability to be able to serve God in such dynamic ways. But the point is what he's getting across here is we all have these dreams of our lives. They may happen. They may not happen. Put your hope, put your devotion into something or someone bigger rather than just one concept or idea. Put your trust in the one who created the world, this universe. We do this through the work of Jesus on the cross. You know, we can become so busy and distracted, and this is what Jesus was warning us all of, that we can miss what's really the most important. And Paul writes about this, even of what Jesus did on the cross. He said this to a church in the city of Corinth. He said, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. He goes, they don't understand it. They minimize it. It's not that big of a deal. But we who are being saved, we know it's the very power of God. This foolish plan, he calls it, because that's what he, the world would call this. This foolish plan of God is actually wise. It's wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness, which God is not weak, but he's saying the weakness, the, the very weakness of God, if there was some, is still so much stronger than the greatest of human strength. In other words, God is way up here and we're down here. God's plans are way up here and ours are down here. And he's saying there is power in what Jesus did on the cross for you and I. He goes on to say, God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy and he freed us from our sin. So maybe we can think on these three things um, in our lives right now. Maybe what we can do is we can ask ourselves these questions. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus on that cross, we can ask ourselves just what Paul wrote about. Am I in right standing with God? In other words, have I said yes to Jesus? Do I believe that the work on the cross made a difference for me in my life, that he could bring salvation to me? Do I have peace with God and the peace of God in my life because I, I have Jesus in my life? Secondly, am I grateful that because of Jesus, when God sees me, he sees Jesus? Remember what Paul wrote. He said, we are pure and holy in the sight of God. Another, so the, a, a, another follow-up to that is, is there any shame that I need to release to God because Jesus paid the price for my sin? I don't have to live under condemnation anymore. I can live a healthy uh, relationship with God. I can come to God whenever I need to, hopefully not just when I need stuff, but just to be with him so I can stay close to him. And then finally, do I believe and know that I really am freed from that consequence of sin, which is death. I don't have to be afraid of death anymore. So the question I want to ask you is this. Because Jesus rose from the dead, because he died from the cross, on the cross for our sins, have you said yes to Jesus? And that's the question, isn't it? That's the most important question. Because, you know, one day we're going to stand before God, all of us, good or bad, no matter what our situation in life. And we're going to be asked basically two questions. And that first question is, what have you done with everything that I've given to you? Have you looked at it as a gift? Have you uh, taken advantage of all of that? And have you lived life with what I've given to you? But the second question he's going to ask you is this, what have you done with my son, Jesus? Have you said yes to him? 
Have you invited him into your life? Is he the Lord and Savior of your life? And guys, that's what Ecclesiastes is really all about. That's what wisdom is really all about. It's about choosing the right decision. It's about choosing the right person. It's about choosing Jesus. It's about following him through every season, through every decade of life, through every day of our lives. It's about growing in our relationship with him, learning to love him more and more each day, and learning to love the people that he's put in our life as well. Listen, God wants you to have an incredible life. He wants you to have a life with great well-being, no matter what situations you're dealing with. He wants you to thrive, and he wants you to flourish. And you can do that, good days and bad days, by keeping your eyes on God and keeping your heart aligned with him. So I hope that's what you'll do. I hope that you'll follow Jesus, as he said, follow me every day of your life, and you'll be better for it. God bless you.